This is Dennis Ramundi. I'm here with my co-host, Phil Goldberg, uh, author of American Veda. Our podcast, Spirit Matters Talk, spiritmatterstalk.com. Our guest today, Dr. Joe Dispenza. Uh, he is uh, an expert in the area of neurophysiology. Uh, I recently heard a TED Talk you gave, Joe. I enjoyed it very much. And he's also an author. He's written uh, uh, two books, uh, the first being Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself, and the most recent book, You Are a Placebo both New York Times bestsellers. Uh, Dr. Dispenza, thank you so very much for taking the time to come on to speak with us today. Oh, I'm happy to be with you guys. Great. Uh, Joe, uh, we like to begin by having the uh, guest tune in our listeners uh, to something about their own uh, past and, and what brought them to their work. Can you give us a kind of overview of your own uh, spiritual and scientific journey, and what brought you to this uh, provocative work you've been doing? Yeah, I think a lot of uh, us, in order for us to wake up, we need a wake-up call, and uh, in 1986, I got the call. I got uh, run over by a truck in a triathlon in Palm Springs, California, and uh, broke six vertebrae in my spine and uh, had bone fragments on my spinal cord and had broken the neural arch of one of the vertebrae, and in uh, cases like this, after four opinions from four of the leading surgeons in Southern California, the typical procedure is what's called Harrington rod surgery, and that's a very aggressive surgery where they cut off the back parts of your vertebrae and then screw in these long stainless steel rods. And in my case, it would be from the base of my neck to the base of my spine. And uh, then they take bone uh, chips from your, uh, they scrape bone fragments from your hip and they and then they paste it over the top and they hope for the best and um the prognosis was that i'd probably never walk again and and uh, so i had to make a decision so if i was going to go with a conventional model and possibly spend the rest of my life handicapped or in some way uh, uh struggling with uh, medications and pain or maybe i should take another route and see if i could actually heal myself and so uh, I chose the second route, and uh, thank God it worked. I, I uh, spent quite a bit of time going within and and beginning to change my inner world, and it started to produce effects in my body, and I just made a deal with myself. I said if I was ever able to walk again, I'd spend the rest of my life studying the mind-body connection and mind over matter, and that's what I've been doing since 1986. Uh, Joe, uh, in, in that process of going in and working on yourself, what, what uh, spiritual <clears throat> techniques or... Or, or technologies did you uh, use uh, to, to do that, or, or was it all something you developed intuitively yourself? Well, there wasn't a lot of, back in 1986, there wasn't a lot of support for going against conventional medicine at the time. And uh, I think if it was a patient of mine and I saw the MRIs and the CAT scans and the x-rays and uh, examined the patient, I probably would have recommended, you know, the same surgery, but... Um, now, this was me, and I wasn't so quick to just uh, uh, go under the knife. And so I just had this thought, and it's the same thought uh, that permeates me ever since that day, is that the power that made the body heals the body. And I thought that this intelligence that gives us life, that keeps our heart beating and digesting our food and organizing trillions of cellular functions every second, that intelligence is a consciousness, and consciousness is awareness, and awareness is paying attention. So I made a decision that I was going to make contact with that intelligence and give it some very specific plans, a template, a design of exactly what I wanted. When I was happy and complete with my design, I would surrender my intention to this greater mind and, and allow it to do what it does way better than me. That was the first thing. The second thing I said is I'm not going to let any thought slip by my awareness that I don't want to experience. That sounds really easy, but when you're in crisis or trauma or you're facing some type of uh, catastrophe or, or diagnosis, we tend to focus on what we don't want to have happen instead of what we do want to have happen. And so <clears throat> I went through pretty much six to seven weeks of the dark night of the soul because I couldn't get my mind to do what I wanted it to do. If consciousness is awareness and awareness is paying attention, then this intelligence is observing us. And so I would start recreating my spine vertebrae per vertebrae, and then I'd start thinking about living in a wheelchair, or should I sell my home, or should I sell my practice, and I'd lose my attention. 
And just like with anybody else, you know when someone's paying attention to you or present because they're they're giving you their attention. And uh, I realized that I couldn't follow through on the design, and so every every time I lost my attention, I'd start over and and uh, over and over again. Uh, it took me quite a bit of time, but after seven weeks or so, I was able to go through the whole process without losing my attention or focus. And uh, that was the key moment because it was, it was like I hit a tennis ball in the sweet spot. Something clicked, and from what normally took me three hours to do to go through this whole process, I was able to do it in 45 minutes. And I didn't know it at the time, but I was increasing my attention span. And at the same time, I was firing and wiring new circuits in my brain and creating a new level of mind. And I think when we pay attention to that degree, our inner world becomes more real than our outer world and the brain and body don't know the difference. And so my body started to respond to my mind and, um, I started noticing that the pain in my body dramatically reduced. A lot of the, the neurological um, imbalances came back uh, uh, on, and I started noticing I had more control. And, and as soon as I was able to correlate uh, the changes that were happening outside of me with what I was doing inside of me, I started paying attention to what I was doing. And I, instead of doing it with frustration and dread and impatience, I was doing it now with inspiration and joy and excitement. And... Um, you know, they told me that I'd probably never walk again, and if I did, I'd have to wear a body cast uh, for six months to a year. And I was back on my feet in uh, ten and a half weeks, and back to my life at twelve weeks, and and uh, that started the whole process for me. That this is fascinating. I have a few questions just to uh, <clears throat> tie up any loose ends about your story. Um, all this took place, it would seem, while you were hospitalized. Um, that's one question. The other is, had you had um, any, um, you had scientific training, you were already a chiropractor, had you had a spiritual background prior to that that gave you a template for any of this, or was it all self-discovery? <clears throat> ah, you know, it's a very good question. Number one, um, I, after the four opinions from four of the leading surgeons, I, and I decided against the surgery, I left the hospital, and... Um, that wasn't the environment that was going to support me. Mm. And so I went to a friend's home where it was a beautiful home in San Diego and, and I was able to not be distracted from what I wanted to do. And, and, um, so I left the hospital because I wanted to have the proper conditions, uh, to, to begin to make contact. And the second thing is, I think, I think science is the contemporary language of mysticism right now. I think science demystifies the mystical. And I was probably young enough and innocent enough and maybe even a little arrogant and enough at the time uh, to trust my intuition. I just thought, God, there's this intelligence that's giving us life and not a lot of people spend a lot of time developing a relationship with it. So I thought, well, if I start interacting with it and communicating with it and start really putting my attention on it, maybe I could begin to see if it could respond. So I didn't have a lot of spiritual, in that sense, uh, um, training, but I did believe in human potential, number one, and I thought, you know, well, I had a lot of philosophy, I had a lot of intellectual information, I had a lot of, I had a lot of data, but when you begin to initiate that philosophy, when you begin to do something with it, um, if you can get your mind and body working together, you should have some type of transformation, and so... For me personally, it was a process of self-discovery. Now, since that time, I mean, I went back to school and uh, got a degree in neuroscience and spent a lot of time studying uh, quite a bit more. And But when you combine a little quantum physics with a little neuroscience, with a little neuroendocrinology and a little psychoneuroimmunology and epigenetics, all of those sciences point the finger at possibility. So when I was back on my feet, then I said, I got to go back and uh, I got to figure out what happened to me. I mean, how did that all occur? So that's when I started uh, studying spontaneous remissions uh, and traveled to 17 different countries and interviewed people that were diagnosed with um, chronic and, and somewhat fatal uh, diseases. And I, and they were treating conventionally or unconventionally and um, they were staying the same or getting worse. And all of a sudden they got better. And I wanted to know what the cause was that produced the effect. So, my first book was actually called Evolve Your Brain, The Science of Changing Your Mind. And that's where I get into the science of how that's possible. And 
when we started teaching workshops and conferences after What the Bleed, um, we started seeing people starting to really change because I think it's, it's not enough to know right now. You've got to know how. And people want to know how to apply these principles. Mm-hmm. So the second book is kind of more about the how-to, breaking the habit of being yourself. Is really we give people the information and then we give them the, the, the methods to begin to produce the changes. And so um, it's just kind of organically unfolded. And I think people right now, uh, there's, a, there's a change in consciousness and people want to understand really how to do it. And right. so uh, I've studied enough people at this point that have done it, and at the same time, I've I've understand the science to a, a, to the best of my ability. And now, we're actually measuring. You know, we have a team of neuroscientists and researchers that come to our workshops, and we're measuring brain function. We're measuring heart rate variability. We're measuring epigenetic changes. We're measuring neurotransmitter levels. We're measuring the energy of the room, the energy around people's bodies. We're measuring all kinds of physiological changes because I think then when people see that you don't have to be a uh, <clears throat> a Buddhist monk or a nun with 40 years of devotion or a Kabbalistic rabbi or a uh, academic or scholar, you can be a common person. Uh, I think that people really begin to, to latch on to this. And boy, I have to tell you, I've seen uh, quite a bit of um, unconventional and miraculous things happen with people healing themselves from all types of diseases and conditions once they know how. And if you give people the what and the why, the how gets easier. Right. Uh, Joe, let, let me ask you, uh, uh, the, the neurophysiology of what's taking place in regard to what you did to heal yourself, is that the <clears> same <throat> neurophysiology that's taking place when a person you know, goes into remission from cancer, say? And, and often when a person goes, usually when a person goes into remission from cancer, they haven't done anything. It just sort of happens uh, you know, uh, spontaneously by itself. But is the, the, what's going on in, in the brain, is that the same as what uh, you do, you've done yourself and you are now teaching. Yeah, well, it's, it's probably not as simple to explain it in 10 minutes, but I will tell you this. Your body is a protein-producing machine. Muscle cells make muscle proteins. Skin cells make skin proteins called collagen and elastin. Muscle cells make actin and myosin. Stomach cells make enzymes. Your body is a protein-producing machine. In order for your body to make a protein, Every cell has to regulate, a uh, gene has to be signaled. So when a gene is expressed, it makes a protein. So if you're thinking the same way, if you're acting the same way, and if you're feeling the same way, you keep signaling the same genes in the same way, and your body keeps producing the same proteins. The expression of proteins is the expression of life. So if a person is reacting to the same people in their life and they're going to the same places and they're doing the exact same things at the exact same time every single day, for the most part, their environment is beginning to regulate how they think and feel and act. And so as an effect, their body's headed towards a genetic destiny. So if a person then begins to disconnect from their external environment, close their eyes, sit their body down and no longer do anything and forget about time, that's the moment their inner world starts to become more real than their outer world. If you can teach people what they're doing in the process of being able to regulate and signal new genes, to rehearse new, new activities in their mind mentally, to begin to change um, emotions that keep them anchored to the past, the process of literally uh, of, of, of making that connection internally begins to change the brain and body to look like the experience has already happened. And it's the repetition of that cycle then <clears throat> that begins to signal new genes in new ways that causes the person to begin to change. Now, some of those, some of those people that had spontaneous remissions, I thought they were spontaneous remissions until I got to talk to them and they weren't so spontaneous at all. Uh-huh. In fact, they were really changing uh, something about themselves or surrendering something that worry or fear and it was the exact recipe or formula that gave their body a chance to co- come back into homeostasis and balance. How interesting. You, are you su- you're suggesting that what um, people in conventional medical circles would call a spontaneous remission, that there are some commonalities that have not been um, appreciated, and those uh, commonalities uh, are aligned with the kind of practices that you are, you've been teaching people having to do with the mind and attitude and so forth. 
I do think so. I think we're closing the gap a little bit more. The gap used to be a very, very vast field and domain where uh, it was unexplainable. Mm -hmm. Uh, There was no cause that produced the effect. But we're now beginning to see then that people are beginning to make different choices and beginning to question the nature of their disease and look to see how they may have have been an influence in, in some of their health problems. And so I think the gap has just closed to a certain degree. And the more we close the gap, the more people are empowered to take, uh, uh, you know, make better choices for themselves as well. Right. Joe, Joe uh, for folks that are healers, and I assume, you know, some are real, some are not real, whatever, but people that are, are healers, are, are they um, uh, initiating the same sorts of activities internally that, that you would be? Is, uh, how do they work? <clears throat> well, that's a very interesting concept. You can explain that phenomenon without understanding the quantum model of reality because everything, according to quantum physics, is vibrating at a certain frequency or speed. I say that all disease is a lowering frequency. The slower the frequency, the more you are matter and the less you are energy. Mm -hmm. The more elevated the frequency, the more elevated the energy, the more you are resonating faster than uh, matter. And it's when people have the ability to raise their vibrational state, but not only raise their state, but to produce a very coherent and organized frequency. Coherence is rhythm. Coherence is cadence. Coherence is waves all working together. And when waves begin to work together, frequency begins to become synchronized. The effect is that the signal begins to entrain matter. So that's a skill. People say, well, I never really felt that energy. Well, you haven't paid attention to it too much. And if you haven't paid attention to your nose, you don't even know you have a nose until you put your attention on it. So if you can train people to direct that energy, and it requires only two things according to what we've studied so far with our team a clear intention, and an elevated emotion. It's those two ingredients that begin to produce electromagnetic effects effects in and around the person's body. And so by raising the frequency of another person's body, they're able to then cause it to respond to mine. And, um, well, we've seen some pretty cool things happen. Interesting. Uh, uh, Joe, are the methods you're doing, you're using in your research... Uh, on your website, it mentions things like uh, terms like brain mapping and heart math monitors. Are those procedures uh, generally accepted in the scientific community? Are they esoteric? Has the scientific community, uh, the mainstream scientific community, responded to your research favorably? Are they, uh, you know, how is it regarded in you know conventional scientific circles? Well, to answer your question, absolutely. Um, we use uh, quantitative electroencephalographic readings. Um, mm-hmm. We want to see a person create brain changes. We want to know when they change their brain states. We want to train them on how to do that. Mm-hmm. We want them to create coherent brainwave patterns. We want, we want them to be able to understand when they're having intrusive thoughts or overanalyzing or living by the hormones of stress. We want them to be able to change that because they have the ability and the skill to do that. So the quantitative studies that we've done have captured a lot of uh, attention in the scientific community because a person's not using pharmaceuticals, they're not medicated, they're not doing any extensive um, psychotherapeutic techniques. They're coming to a four-day workshop. We're scanning their brain when they walk in. They're going through four days of intense training. And at the end of four days, we're rescanning their brain, and we can say, hey, that person doesn't have Parkinson's anymore because it's not just in their mind, it's in the brain. It's changed. <clears throat> We're able to produce that. And of course, the effects of that is really captures a lot of people's attention because we're not using conventional methods. By the same means, when a person is experiencing frustration or impatience or anger, their heart actually moves out of rhythm. It becomes very incoherent. When a person feels gratitude, appreciation, joy, thankfulness, kindness, compassion, the heart moves into resonance and coherence. And the field around the heart begins to be, become broadened. Now, this is science. Measurements <clears throat> over and over again show that when we open our heart, 
we're broadcasting different magnetic signatures into the field. So <clears throat> the research that we're doing is capturing a lot of attention because even some of the neuroscientists and researchers that come and observe at our workshops, they're pretty mystified because some of the, the, the values and measurements we're getting are not normal. They're actually super normal. And so that begins to say, okay, that's how we have to move the needle to what we think normal is. And, and um, we know that when a person has a true mystical experience or a true transcendent moment or a gestalt moment or an epiphany, it's not just a subjective experience any longer because if we're measuring it, now we can say, wow, there's been very strong objective changes taking place in your brain and body. And if a person's chemical levels change dramatically, and it's correlating with what we're finding, we've got a better model to teach it better the next time. And, and, um, and um, it, it actually, in the last two years, we've made scientific history with some of the, some of the things we've captured. Right. Joe, I, I, I follow up on that. Uh, the equipment uh, that you use now, uh, and uh, it sounds like the, the, the most sophisticated types of measurements you can do on human physiology, uh, you know, in addition to EEG and many other things, but are, are there types of equipment uh, uh, that you would like to see developed that would measure certain things in regard to the human physiology or what human physiology may put out in terms of energy or whatever that are in the process of being developed or you would like to see developed uh, in the near future? So you can, you know, look more closely at what's going on. You mean like if you were to give me a research grant for $10 million? <laughs> yeah, exactly. $20 million. Yeah. By the, by the way, I'm funding all of this research myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Really? Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, gosh darn it. I mean, uh, a single positron emission computer tomography for the brain spec scans are really great ways to measure uh, <clears throat> three-dimensionally some more activity. Um, there are there are certain quantitative uh, machines that can measure uh, the electromagnetic field around the person's body. Of course, uh, right. they're in early stages of development. But man, I tell you, if we could, if we could, if we were able to refine that, we would we would get a lot of data. We're we're <clears throat> the research for telomere lengths, which is the little shoestrings on the end of your DNA that every time your cell divides, it shortens, and it tells you your biological age. <clears throat> We're going to start to begin to do more uh, genetic testing <clears throat> because we believe that you can change those as well. So, um, yeah, we're there's just it's endless. We could go on forever. Yeah. Um, so now, a lot of the research on uh, neurophysiology of uh, meditation has been going on for well about 45 years now. Uh, since the first studies were done, and we know a whole lot more. We've, we've interviewed uh, Roger Walsh and uh, Paul Mills, who does research at Deepak Chopra's foundation and, and other people. I'm curious uh, about the, the connection or any, any uh, correlations you found in your particular research and how it... Uh, fits with the, the, the body of research on meditative states that have been going on for, for, for a couple, some decades now. Do you team up with those people? Do you publish together any of that? Um, we, uh, we have been in contact with several different universities and several different neuroscientists, <clears throat> as well as the HeartMath Institute and a lot of their um, staff and affiliates. I think that if you're talking about meditation in general, <clears throat> we know that meditation without a doubt, and it's across the board, even in our research, does increase forebrain activity. You have to pay attention, and that's the forebrain that does that. <clears throat> we also know that meditation creates tremendous amounts of synchronization and coherence in the brain. And what syncs or synchronizes in the brain or syncs together in the brain links together in the brain. The antithesis of that is when people live by the hormones of stress and they're trying to control and predict everything in their life, the very fact that they're living in survival causes different compartments of their brain to no longer communicate with each other and begin to subdivide. It's that fracturing of neurological tissue <clears throat> that causes the person to be incoherent in their life. In other words, when your brain is incoherent, you're incoherent. So. The mere fact of a person just becoming more attentive 
to what's going on on their inner world and less attentive to what's going on in their outer world and begins to slow down a lot of that disintegration. That's without a doubt the common with most meditative techniques. We also know <clears throat> that when people have uh, imbalances in their brain uh, because of stress, there's a, a network of neurons called the default mode network. And Yale University did the study and we reproduced it with our students. When you have that default mode network going, that's the voice, that's the critic in the back of your head, that's the devil on your shoulder that's talking to you, saying you can, it's too hard, you'll never change, you're not good enough, what's wrong with me? Well, it's called intrusive thoughts. Uh, <clears throat> and you can see that on a, on a scan. When a person's able to center their attention, that default mode network shuts off during meditation. But the cool part about it is, is that network stays off for the remainder of the day. So the, the analytical mind tends to be diminished quite a bit. The more you're living by the hormones of stress, the more that analytical mind is in higher gear. So we've seen our students uh, regulate and change <clears throat> those intrusive thoughts uh, pretty consistently. We also know that when a person gets happy or when they start mastering something, some skill, some thought, some attitude, left frontal lobe, just like Davidson has shown at the University of Wisconsin, that left frontal lobe tends to be, become more activated. That's the happy spot in the brain. We've seen our students have that consistently occur. We know that a mystical experience usually takes place in the right temporal lobe. That's been reproduced several times. We've seen that in our work and other people's work. But one of the things that we haven't seen that we're recording, uh, which makes it very uh, unique, is that we're seeing high amplitudes of energy take place in a lot of our students' brains uh, during um, uh, long um, uh, acts of contemplative practice. In other words, when a neurological network fires in your brain, <clears throat> there's a discharge of electricity, and it's usually around 40 microvolts of energy squared. So 10 to 60 tends to be normal in most people. We're capturing up to a million microvolts up to 4 million microvolts of energy uh, in our students' brains. Now, a lot of neuroscientists, when they see that, they question it because they say, oh, my God, that's a seizure. But the problem is that the person is not having a seizure. They're having a full-on sensory experience without their senses. In other words, whatever is going on between their ears is absolutely real to them. So if experience enriches the brain and experience produces emotions, emotions are the end product of experience, all of a sudden, when a person has a transcendent inner experience that's more profound than any external past experience, their biology changes in a very short amount of time, and it's almost like their past is literally washed away out of their bodies. And we've seen quite a bit of uh, spontaneous healings when we've seen these high levels of amplitude. Joe, jo, I have uh, one final question for you, and then Phil can follow up. Uh, if somebody wants to, you know, heal themselves if they want to learn what you've been discussing. <clears throat> uh, can they go to your book or your website? How do, how do they follow up and, and uh, do what they need to do to, to get this knowledge? Well, I think probably the best place to start, my last book, You Are the Placebo, I go through extensive measures to show that really all we have all the, we have all the innate capacity to heal ourselves. It's, chemicals that work just as well as any placebo or any drug. So I'd start out with you with a placebo. If people want to come and have a hands-on experience, uh, they can come to some of the workshops that we do pretty much around the world. Um, in March, uh, we'll be at the Propala Yoga Center, uh, March 5th and 6th in, uh, in Lenox, Massachusetts. I'm on the West Coast in Sacramento. But the following weekend, but pretty much go to the website, drjoedispenza.com, and people come, um, they put them, you know, they, they come, we put them into an experience, we teach them how to do it, and uh, we work the entire uh, weekend. It's a Friday night, all day Saturday, all day Sunday. And we give them a lot of tools that they can begin to practice in their lives. Great. Joe, um, I'm curious about one thing, which is, um, well, I'm curious about a lot, but we don't have mm -hmm. time. <clears throat> we'll have to do it again. Um, in all this work you've done over, what, almost 30 years now, I guess, um, 
how has it affected your your spiritual life, your <clears throat> understanding of uh, who we are and how we relate to the larger cosmos, all the usual questions around religion and spirituality? Well, gosh, so I think I need a, a bottle of wine in about two hours. <laughs> and, you know, next time you're in L.A., we'll have dinner. <clears throat> Let's do that. But I really think that I really think that this is such an amazing time to be alive because when I wrote You Are the Placebo, the biggest thing that I learned that I, in the whole process of just understanding how powerful thought is is that we're not linear beings living a linear life, that we've been conditioned into hit and hypnotized into believing that we need something outside of us to change how we really feel inside of us. And when you begin to turn that battleship around and instead of living as a victim to reality, that we are creators of reality. And I think we get down to the process of proving to ourselves that we, we have within ourselves all the and it, um, tools and machinery to begin to live a more enriched life. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, all the things that we thought made us happy no longer matters because I think you and I, all three of us, are, are, are at our best moment. And I've studied enough brain scans to tell you that we're at our absolute best when we get beyond ourselves, when we trust our heart, when we give, when we contribute, when we make a difference, and we're no longer competing or judging or fighting to get to the top. But in fact, <clears throat> we open our hearts, and I think that creates community, and I think the world's ready for it. Great, Joe. Thank you so very much. Uh, and, and as Phil said, we'll have to do, do, do a follow-up. Our guest today has been Dr. Joe Dispenza. His books, You Are the Placebo, and his book before that, Breaking the Habit, of being yourself, uh, and uh, Joe, perhaps you, you can once again give us uh, your website. It's drjoedispenza.com. Okay. Phil, any final thoughts, words? No, uh, uh, Joe, uh, it was great to have you with us, and if you have any uh, final words for our listeners, we'd love to hear it. Otherwise, we'll have them find you online. <clears throat> well, I think that the, the final word is to prove to yourself that you're the creator of your life by taking a little time out of your busy day and, and to make contact with that invisible field of intelligence that is the unifying field that gives life to all things and begin to see uh, if it produces any synchronicities or serendipities in your life. If you can produ produce some effect, you might want to do it again the next day and see where it takes you. Great. Very good. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, guys.